Um, and it speaks to kind of why we're here. We're, we're here because everybody's got a right to live. Everybody's got a right to live. We know we're up against the uh, healthcare industry that is invested and in, in making money off of our, our suffering um, and privatizing healthcare through things like One Care for Moms, um, who are aiming to cut social programs and, and privatizing the, the, the care we need. Um, and we know that our, our answer is, is, is both very simple and, and it's, and it's kind of this, the big challenge of why we're here. We need to uh, unite, we need to organize all across the state and come together in one common movement. Um, to, to declare and, and, and realize healthcare as a human right. Um, so, just keeping that, that grounding very brief, I want to, uh, we're going to be hearing from a number of people today about why we're doing this. We all have some sort of personal connection, but we're hearing stories that represent kind of a range of experiences. Um, and to, to start us off, uh, we're going to hear from Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Dis uh, Developmental Disabilities Council. My name is Susan Aronoff, and I do work for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And I want to welcome you all to the State House. This is a really a tremendous um, turnout. It's great to see this room packed. And um, I hope you have a great day. And one thing I love about the Worker Center is the way that the Worker Center organizes and makes connections and brings people together. And what's really nice about this Medicaid day and this Medicaid assembly and the Medicaid agenda is that the Worker Center and the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council right now are squarely on the same page with, about Medicaid. So there are two issues you guys are going to be talking about today that are in our platform that I just want to give you two, two bits of information about. So, one of the issues you're going to be talking about is no more Medicaid money for this organization in Vermont called One Care Vermont. Yeah. So, it's a for-profit company. It's owned fair and square by University of Vermont Medical Center, Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. Because of that, if they need money for their operations, they can get their investors to invest a bit more. The thing about them getting Medicaid money is that the other programs and services that Medicaid can go to, like 
Washington County Mental Health or your favorite home health agency or any other designated or specialized services agency that provides the services so that people with disabilities can live in the community and get to the places they want to be and communicate with the people they want to communicate with, those agencies could be getting this Medicaid money too. And they don't have big investors like the University of the Med Vermont Medical Center. So it's really important to make sure that people with disabilities in Vermont and their family members can have the services and supports they need in the community. That's where the Medicaid money should be going, and that's where this Medicaid money that's been going to one care could be going. And you guys should know that when that money was approved to come into the state of Vermont, it was approved to go oh my God, I'm sorry. to an ACO. That's what it's called. One care is called an ACO. And this money could either go to ACOs or these community agencies. So far, to date, this is true, our agency of human services has only contracted with the ACO, with one care for this money. It's time limited money. The time is up. <laughs> you should go to the community agencies. The other issue where we are right on the same page with Medicaid has to do with, can we evaluate this thing before we go forward? Um, you've seen a lot of press about this. A most recent uh, piece written by a member of the Green Mountain Care Board supposed to be regulating this, but instead they do a lot, spend a lot of time promoting it. Tom Pello, Green Mountain Care Board member, just had a piece in Digger just over the weekend, and he spelled it out really clearly. This is a test. This thing we're doing with one care and the all payer model, it's supposed to be a test. Most tests, you evaluate them, and then really, equally importantly, you have a plan B. So we're going all in. We're all in the Petri dish, the test tube. We're all in it together, but there's no plan B, and no one is seriously evaluating it. And the people who could be evaluating it or planning a plan B are actually parties to the contract that brought this to us. What I mean by that is both the Green Mountain Care Board and Vermont's Agency of Human Services are both parties legally on a contract to create this all-payer model. So they're not in a good position to evaluate is it working and what would another path be. We need an independent evaluation to do that before we decide to extend this experiment for another five years. So that's one of the things in your materials. That's right in our platform. So I'm so glad to see you guys here and lead on. And I'll leave uh, copies of the platform around. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from uh, individual stories about about the healthcare crisis and about why why we're here. So starting out with Maddie Walker and um, hi everybody. Hi. 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 I'm Maddie. It's really great to see so many people here today. Um, I'm just going to share my story. So I developed a chronic illness when I was 18. I had just started college. Um, and it first manifested as pain, nausea. I had emergency room visits. I saw specialists. I saw counselors who thought maybe it was all in my head. And through all of that, I had my parents' insurance. And that insurance, despite being pretty great for the state that we live in, left me with a lot of debt. So I am 21 years old and medical debt is a constant part of my life. And concerning myself with how I'm going to afford the medical treatment, I need to function to be a member of this community and to do this work. Healthcare is such an important thing that I know I never thought about until I needed to. I didn't think about the fact that I had to pay $75 to go into a doctor's office because I wasn't going into a doctor's office every other day. But when I was faced with this situation where I was incredibly hurting and I felt lost, I thought I would have community and care to fall back on. I thought, naively apparently, that there was 
a situation, an institution, there was something in place to take care of our people when they can't take care of themselves. Because I know my parents didn't want to have an 18-year-old kid whose medical bills they couldn't afford. I know that I didn't want to worry how I was going to make rent because I had five, six, seven bills to different hospitals to pay. And I thought that there would be an option for this community that I had been a part of, this community that had raised me. I thought that there would be an option for me to seek help. And there wasn't. And I found the work. I found a group of people who realized that I'm not, it made me realize that I'm not the only person who thinks that we should take care of each other. Yeah. This idea that we are a community and that we are all the product of this community that we are a part of. And right now, my debt, the pain, the treatment I'm not receiving, that's a product of our community. But is that the community we want? A community that lets people get sick, die, go into debt, we end up on the streets because they can't afford the health care they need. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and the next we'll have uh, Bonnie Gordon will speak next. Hey, I'm Bonnie Gordon from Washington County, from right here. Uh, I'm someone who is deeply affected by the Medicaid crisis. I'm, I was diagnosed with an illness five years ago with liver cancer. And because I wasn't able to receive all the treatment I needed in one place, I wound up having to bounce all over the United States and take advantage of loopholes in the Medicaid system. And that's not something anybody should have to do. My treatment took, I'm luckily right now I'm healthy, but my treatment took way longer, four years longer than it should have, as early as I caught it. And that's something that should not happen. Luckily, I was able to pull out of it. There are tons of people, though, who never make it out and who are, suffer until they no longer are with us. And that's not something that should be tolerated. Like, health care for profit is not viable. It's not sustainable. Like, it doesn't make sense, and it's just benefiting the top 1%. So it's on us to come together and to demand change in the health care system and for us to really make sure that, to hold everyone accountable, all their promises, all the things that we need, we have to take. And that's why I'm here. Well, I have an intellectual disability, and like, if I didn't know the community works, I would not be able to get to my job at all. I do have a significant health care issue. So we need our health and we need to get more Medicaid funding. Yeah. Yeah. Next we're gonna hear from Connie Bowen. I'm Connie Bowen, I'm from Derby, and I live close to the Canadian border. I had four children and I was a foster parent. The foster child had all kinds of insurance, and mine did. We had all we could do to keep the farm going and, and put food on the table and so on and so forth. And my first child was born with a cut lip, a cut palate, and required a lot of medical uh, services throughout his life. And uh, until he joined the Air Force, and. Uh, we used to have, we were lucky because where I live, we had a Canadian doctor that was just marvelous. <laughs> and we could go there, $10 is what it, we paid. And I've seen and heard so many things over the years with people that have children with the Medicaid and the Medicare and all that, you know, and they want to cut certain organs Isations want to cut our funding for everything, and because we're right on the bottom, always. And uh, anyway, my husband had a stroke. Uh, 
four years ago, and he required a lot of care, and we didn't have Medicare at that time, and so that left us with 20% of that cost to pay ourselves. And when you have to have a helicopter fly you from Derby to Burlington, that's, that 20% is pretty high. I think it's about time that we got together and and joined around and rallied around to get yes. free care for everybody. Mm -hmm. Because this is ridiculous. Sure. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Erica Thompson. So I started off by sharing my first um, connection with Medicaid is the fact that I'm a single mom who was living on Cadillac insurance when my husband worked for the St. John's Bay Academy. We separated. Um, at first I was told I had to pay in and do the Blue Cross Blue Shield on my own through the Healthcare Connect. And then luckily I found a wonderful person in my doctor's office who connected me and said, no, you more than qualify to have Medicaid for the income you bring in, and put all three of my children on Dr. Dinosaur. But there's another hat I wear where I'm very connected to Medicaid. I've been a shared living home care provider for 20 years. And for people that don't know, the way that program is funded is through Medicaid dollars and a Medicaid waiver. Um, one of my individuals is here with me today. She's joined the Vermont Workers and has been advocating for herself along with me. But both of the individuals I have, their family, for whatever reasons, is not involved in their lives. I am their family. And I work 24-7 with them for a wonderful $45 a day. <laughs> That's what the state feels this service is worth. That really, we're providing a life and amazing opportunities for these individuals when we take them into our homes but $46, and we don't get any benefits. There's no health insurance. We get a little bit of respite that's considered our vacation time, but some individuals, you could be waking up two, three o'clock in the morning to help them through their days. Um, you never know and what could come up with them, and they really, truly become your family. school system did. Um, after 17 years we got divorced. Um, I was on my own. I didn't have any medical. Um, and I've been doing drywall for 40 years. And I ended up with health problems. I was diagnosed with an AFib heart, high blood pressure, spot on the lungs, fluid in the lungs. But I was able to work for another year until last year, February, um, I had some health issues again. Um, I was out of work for three weeks. Went to my doctor telling him I was couldn't breathe. Um, I was having a hard time uh, doing anything physical. And then I went up to the emergency room to have things checked out. Um, I was up there for four days, but the first day I was up there, they told me that my medical insurance was canceled because I hadn't been working. And I only had medical insurance for four years before that because it was mandatory through my company. Um, so they put me on Medicaid. Um, I was diagnosed with diabetes in, in March, the end of March. Um, I was also diagnosed with a hole in the lining of the heart. I was also diagnosed with the PFO was torn open. 
Um, I have sleep apnea now. Um, shame on my heart because I stopped breathing 89 times in one hour. Um, I'm on 11 different prescriptions now. Three of them are heart medicines, high blood pressure medicine, two diabetes medicines. Uh, I take more medicine than I've ever had. I never saw a doctor until I was 58 years old. And Medicaid right now pays for everything that I need. That's the only good thing I got. I'm living in a shelter now. I'm trying to get my Social Security disability. Medicaid is the only good thing that I've got right now. And do not touch it as it is. Leave it as is. Thank you. So at this time, I'm going to ask that everybody turn to a neighbor. Someone ideally you don't know, or maybe even split to a small group. And take a couple minutes to share your personal connection to the health care crisis. Or a story of a loved one or a neighbor struggling with health care concerns. disability, they throw you off Medicaid and force you onto Medicare, and you have to pay for Part B, which I don't have $138 a month, so now I'm zapped with the lifetime penalty until I drop dead, which will make that like $175 a month. But a friend and I are going to take a little caravan up and look, for, we're going to call for a Canadian dentist, no? I don't know about the dentist, but the doctors no longer can see the people treat people in the USA. Oh, what? That stuff. Even if you go here, you go. Even if you go to No. Oh, yeah. rats. That stuff. I don't know about the dentist. I'm going to check, check just to be available. sure, but that's, that's ridiculous, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both of us here had experiences with having to choose how many hours we were going to work in order to not be bumped out of Medi Medicare and onto a health plan we couldn't afford. And I wonder how many people have had an experience like that or have had to choose employment based on their basic human need for health care. I was just going to follow up. Um, my son and daughter-in-law and their three kids were living in Montgomery, Vermont. And that exact thing happened to um, their family. Um, my son's business started to do very well, and um, they decided to give themselves a raise to $22,000 a year. And that was the threshold where my son and his family were going to be kicked off of Medicaid and Dr. Dinosaur. So he, or, he didn't take the, the raise. Yeah. Uh, I was just, uh, we were just sharing that um, for. Uh, in the case of migrant farm workers uh, that are milking cows in the dairy farms, 
uh, you know, people don't have uh, the access to healthcare or Medicaid or apply to, to, to those services. And I think it's really important for all of us. Um, we were talking how we need to stand together and, and fight together and do everything that we can to make sure that we are all included. Uh, because that not, that's not sort of like the food system that we want, and that's not sort of the state that we want. Mm. Um, and we were just sort of talking how important it is, like now for all of us to like stand together and fight and sort of do everything that we can um, and hold those that people that are violating our human rights accountable. Uh, so. I, I share a story about my housemate is um, is autistic somewhere on the what used to be Asperger's, although that technically doesn't exist anymore, apparently, um, in the DSM. Anyway, the point is, is that he's unable to get disability. His family, uh, he's 30 now. His family denied his diagnosis and then kicked him out of the house when he was 18. So um, it was really hard for him to work, and he, so he went through his young adulthood not working any official job. And then when he finally got diagnosed when I finally got him to accept his diagnosis in healthcare. Um, he went to get disability, but he had never paid into it with a job, with an official paycheck job. So he was ruled disabled, but gets no benefits for it, not even Medicaid, I mean the cash stuff even. So it, it's entirely money, you know, it's entirely money right now for him and, you know, it just seat of the pants, you know. He's living in Vermont technically illegally, um, just so I and others can take care of them. Um, we just talked a lot about um, how interconnected a lot of these issues are. Just to echo I, what you said, I feel like there was there's this idea that Medicaid for All is, is a great way to kind of rally around each other, but at the same time we have to be thinking about workers in this state that are not wouldn't, wouldn't benefit, benefit from that, especially if they're undocumented. You need a photo ID, you know, to, to even get Medicaid and to go through this, this process. Um, and so we just have to be thinking about the most marginalized among us, and our strategy has to include them as well. Um, we also talked a little bit about diverting funds from things in Vermont. Like, I think that this tried to, I don't know the full context, but I think that there's something like this tried to pass two years ago, if I'm correct. And we, we talked a little bit about that. And I guess it lost popularity. It wasn't able to be funded. And I think that we have to be thinking about diverting funds from, you know, the war machine and how Vermont fund, how, you know, we can think about the F-35s and Bernie um, and Leahy and what they did with that. I mean, there's a lot of funding in Vermont that's going towards these um, imperialist programs. And we need to be really thinking about how we're going to strategize um, and divert funding from things like that to things like healthcare for all, not just Medicaid for all, but healthcare for all, as, as you said about uh, migrant workers in the state. I think um, I, I, for me personally, but also for uh, people with disabilities, first of all, I'm a person with a disability myself, autism in particular, um, and I, I think Medicare, Medicaid is important for me because I wouldn't be able to do the job that I do successfully without the you know, developmental services I get from the state to uh, uh, be here and also uh, connect with people throughout the state and country with disabilities if it wasn't for Medicaid because that, that uh, pretty much uh, pretty much gives me the support through developmental services that I have to, to be here. And also with you know health care, there are so many people with uh, disabilities that are just slipping through the cracks in terms of not getting uh, you know the, uh, enough or proper health care that they deserve. I'd also like to bring up the fact that, uh, well, my husband and I volunteered to uh, for uh, Faith in Action for the food shares, and we, we see a lot of uh, elderly people that come in there, and uh, some of these people have to choose whether they pay get their medicine that month or do they buy food? Mm -hmm. And uh, they cut back on the pay program now, so you know there isn't very much available like it was a few years ago. It's, kind of, it's not, they're not getting a whole lot of funding for that. But it's serious. I mean, if some of these elderly people, if they don't have a friend, it's hard for them. Almost impossible and sad. Because somebody's got to care. Yes, exactly. So I um, uh, was uh, 
diagnosed with a disability and uh, around the time I became homeless. And Medicaid uh, was uh, uh, incredibly helpful for uh, providing health insurance at a time where I needed to access those services for my disability uh, when I uh, was unable to work. And um, I just feel that that uh, was really crucial and uh, uh, a difficult part of my life, but also just uh, proof that like uh, that it it's uh, really important that everyone deserves self care. My name is Diane Tetro. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a licensed mental health counselor. I've been providing services and seeing good people and helping them um, for over 20 years. I've watched this support, this health support, be a lifeline for people, um, the difference between life and death. I think it's very important for those of us who can be here and talk about these things with people we know, our neighbors, our family members, our co-workers, that we help each other connect the dots. We have a situation where a corporation is coming in with lobbying money to convince our legislators that this is a good idea for um, one care to uh, scoop up um, the dollars that are going into uh, Medicaid. It's a sinister plan, um, and it's up to us to educate ourselves and our edu educate our legislators about the seriousness of allowing this to happen. And so this is important. We need to educate ourselves and each other about what's actually going on, not to simplify it. It's not that simple. Um, and, and do do connect with each other. Do connect with legislators. Um, it's it's heartening to see this many people supporting Medicaid because it is a large percentage. It supports a large percentage of the state of Vermont. So, thank you. One one final word from Victor. Um, yes, I served in the United States of America in about 10, 10 years. Unfortunately, I had an accident in one of my planes. Like, almost killed me. When I got out of the military, they acted like I was nothing. They told me that it was my fault the plane crashed. They it was my fault. That it had a pinhole in the line. It was not checked before we went up in the flight. So, I'm in a coma, I was in a coma for a year. I had no insurance when I got out of the military. I had no retirement benefits. I didn't ask for nothing when I came out. But I had health issues because of the damage it did to my head. I had to, you know, I don't want to claim that this, I'm disabled because I can walk, I can talk. I didn't ask for nothing. But then when it comes come time, I had to ask for something. Because, um, you know, I had to go through speech therapy. I had to go through, you know, all kinds of uh, medical treatments because of the damage it did to my head. And I applied for Medicaid and Medicare. And of course, when I first got out, they said, oh, you're not qualified yet for Medicare, so we'll give you Medicaid. And at first it was covering everything I needed. And now it's not covering nothing. I mean, I used to be able to go to an eye doctor and they pay for the exam and they pay for my glasses. I've had these glasses on for 15 years now because I can't afford to buy anymore. Um, and, you know, I have Medicare now, but that's not helping me. So when I go to a doctor, I don't even go to a doctor anymore because I know it's not going to be covered.
Um, so we, we, we know the room is filled with a lot of powerful stories, but we, we also want to make sure that we move on to the other steps of the day where we get to um, actually sort of go and talk to our, uh, our legislators and, and, and make sure that, that, we, that our voices are heard and that action is taken. Um, I also wanted to give a, um, I guess one thing I also to say as we're sort of wrapping up from hearing all these powerful stories that um, we, 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 we truly do mean um, Medicaid for all. No exclusions, no hurdles, um, no one out. So everybody in. This is, and this is, this is just, just the beginning. We're kind of fighting for this to be, to be for everyone. Um, so in just a second, we're going to pass it over to, the, to our policy team at the Worker Center. But um, we did want to finish with a song that just speaks to kind of the ways in which our, uh, our, 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 our experiences are interconnected. Um, so if you want to come up and enjoy, this is a song called Getting Into Step. It's we're getting into step. Uh-huh. We're getting into step. Right. We're getting into step to win our freedom. Too many years we've been divided. Now's the time to unify. We're getting into step to win our freedom. Uh-huh. We're, getting we're, getting step. Step. Uh-huh. we're getting into step. We're getting into step. Time is now to break our chains. Let, Let those who labor hold the reins. The time is now to break our chains. We're getting into step to win our freedom. Too many years we've, we've been, been divided. Now's the time to unify. We're getting into step to win our freedom. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Jessica. I live in Burlington. Um, I'm a member of the policy committee. Co-facilitator. I'm Manny. I live in Wyndham County in a little town called Athens. Um, so this portion is a legislative training, um, and the goal here is to help us feel more confident talking to our legislators, give us a little bit more of a rundown on what our pledge is. Um, but I want to make it clear um, that we are the experts in how the healthcare system is and isn't working for us, right? We don't need to know everything about policy to know that and to tell our legislators our stories. Um, and that's really where our, our, we're getting a lot of our power, right? Is that we, um, we're we coming together to tell our stories like people have been doing all, all day here already. Um, and the other bit of context that I want to give is our work uh, and our movement doesn't doesn't stop here. The, the legislature um, is part of our overall um, target and strategy, but we know that we need to grow a mass movement um, in order to get our needs met. Um, and there are other people that we need to target as well, such as UVM Medical Center and pharmaceutical companies. So. Our work, our, our work doesn't, doesn't stop here. So, uh, why do legislative visits? Anybody? Why do legislative visits? Can we just hear from a few people? Yeah. To wake up the <laughs> what else? To, to, to put a face to the issue. Remind them who, work, who their workers are. Remind them who their workers yeah. are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. say they're going to do. Yeah, and to demonstrate our power in organization, right? To let them know who we are and that we're here for the long haul, that we're not going away. Um, To develop our leadership, to learn how to do this better and better, and and to learn how to work together and work with other people, and um, also to gather intelligence, right? To find out who who are our allies, who are are the folks who are lukewarm or on the fence, and who are the who are the folks who might be obstacles or might be beholden to other interests that we need to know about, that we're going to need to um, work against or work to overcome or work to swing over to our side. Right? So all of these, all of, there's lots of good reasons and they all interconnect about why we're here and, and that we're really working on advancing our policy demands as well as, um, you know, uh, 
increasing our momentum and gaining solidarity and all, all these things interlock and interweave. So that's why we're here and that's why we're going to be talking to folks today. So it's designed to you know, move, our, move our platform forward toward our long-term vision and uh, you know, securing our human right to health care. And um, also just to know, for, you know, I think most folks, a lot of folks here know that Act 48 was passed in 2011. Um, and it still remains the laws of the land um, requiring the legislator and, and Green Mountain Care Board to work towards universal health care. But it hasn't been funded, and that's our long-term goal of really enacting the promise of Act 48. And uh, these, these policy, uh, the policy platform and pledge are designed to move in that direction so that we gain momentum and, uh, in the short term and prevent cuts to Medicaid and uh, keep, the system, keep what, what is good about the system or what's holding people up that's here right now, keep that in place while we work towards our, our long-term goals. Okay? Yeah, so yeah, these materials are to, to help educate our, our legislators about what's going on with the ACO because a lot of them um, don't actually really know a lot of details about it. Um, so we want to walk through the Medicaid Assembly Pledge. So this is what we are asking our legislators to sign on to. This is our, this is our ask in our visits. Do you... Um, do you pledge to, to do these things? Do you promise? Um, and does someone want to read loud for us the first, um, the first, the first one on here? Yeah. Okay. Oppose any cuts, hurdles, or exclusions to or from Medicaid and Dr. Dinosaur. All right. A, across the country, state governments are imposing work requirements and cutting funding for Medicaid. Lawmakers must make it clear that Vermont will hold the line on Medicaid and oppose any threats to the program. All right, great, thank you. So yeah, that's just saying we need health care. We need to expand Medicaid. We don't need any cuts to Medicaid. So is that one pretty clear to folks? Don't cut Medicaid. <laughs> um, how about the second one? No. Direct Medicaid funding to shore up home and community-based services before making any further investments in one pair of Vermont. A. In recent years, tens of millions of dollars in Medicaid investment have been funneled into one pair Vermont, while home and community-based services have been left underfunded threatening services for elders and people with disabilities while forcing down wages for thousands of health care workers. B. Now, one care is demanding even more Medicaid money to prop it up. Lawmakers should deny one care another bailout and increase funding <coughs> for home and community-based services instead. Right. So this one is just saying, no more money to one care. We need that money for health care. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're saying for life. Money to health care, not to one care. Um, any other questions about that, that point? Um, Who is one care? I mean, like... Okay, yeah. Um, one Care is the ACO, or supposedly Accountable Care Organization, which is actually a for-profit corporation that's run by UVM and Dartmouth, where the money, <coughs> money from public dollars are being funneled into this for-profit organization without accountability in terms of where is that money going. Um, and so what we're saying is don't, don't funnel money into this organization. Um, fun actually fund the services that people need. Do you know the logic behind their thinking that Medicaid should bail them out? They, so they keep saying, oh, just give us more time and more money, and we'll show you that we're going to be saving money by adding an extra layer of bureaucracy. <laughs> they're basically <laughs> stringing, <laughs> they're stringing oh, us along. Yes, yes. 
Yeah. What a surprise. Where was mental health, eye health, dental health? Are we getting those things? Probably not. No. Not all of us. All right. Um, Liana, do you want to read the next? Uh, require an independent evaluation of all per ACO model, this legislative section, before the model comes up for renewal. A. Tens of millions in public funds have gone into the all per ACO model in one care Vermont before commuting to another seven years of the model. Lawmakers must Commission an independent evaluation of the model in terms of cost, quality of care, and its impact on health of Vermont residents. So yeah, this one is this is like legislators do your job. You yeah. need to be holding one care accountable, um, and we and having a study helps them say, oh yeah, we do need a plan B, um, and. So we need to be looking into other options rather than just going on faith and saying one hair is going to make Yeah. And actually, just uh, Ellen says this really well. Actually, Plan A was Act 48, and the promise of <laughs> one care is Plan B. Yes. And, and, and it's not really working for people, so we should revert back to Plan A, yes. which is, which is uh, a universal health care system for the promise of Act 48. Yeah. 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 Support H860, which would finish the work of implementing a universal, publicly financed health care system in Vermont. A. Propping up the failing private health insurance system will continue to drain the time, attention, and resources of Vermont's public officials. B. Lawmakers should use H860 to spark discussion about how to move beyond the fundamentally inequitable private health insurance system and finish implementing universal publicly financed health care as laid out in Act 48. So H860, which, so yeah, this is a bill, it was introduced by uh, Burlington Rep. Um, Brian China um, that would basically be moving us forward towards implementing Act 48. Um, so it was introduced into the House Health Committee, um, Health Care Committee, <coughs> Um, session. Um, what you may hear from legislators is, well, there's not the political will to do this right now. We have a Republican governor, da, da, da. but it's a tool to say, do you support this? Do you support moving forward with this? Um, let's keep this moving forward because what we have now isn't working. Um, and so that's something that they can actually do to show their support for it right now is to sign on to that bill. And even if it doesn't pass this session, it's, it's a vehicle to regain momentum in that direction, um, especially in the, um, our representatives, I think, um, are newer. Um, a lot of them are new since um, Shumlin bailed on Act 48 in 2012. Um, and so they don't have the institutional memory that a lot of the senators do who felt really burned by that. And they're like, oh, we're not... <laughs> I don't know if we want to touch that. That was such a debacle, and that ended so badly. And oh, well, maybe you know somebody like Bernie or Elizabeth will get elected, and we'll have you know healthcare will rain on us from above, or something like that. Um, you know, um, but so so this is a vehicle to really regain our momentum in, in, towards that. <laughs> Healthcare for our people. 